Hello, my name is Laura Wanowski, and I will be presenting a brief summary of the November 10th presentation, Plastic Pollution in the Ocean, Choosing Your Toothpaste, by a thermodynamicist in the Georgia Tech School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, Dr. Annalisa Bracco. Most of us are familiar with the disheartening images of animals affected by plastic pollution in the ocean and in the environment. Most of us are equally familiar with images of plastic buildup along coastlines. However, Dr. Bracco's presentation discussed the larger and more severe and ultimately more unknown issue of plastic particles in the open ocean. More than 300 million tons of plastic are manufactured yearly with an average increase of 3 to 4 percent per year. 10 percent of plastic in the United States is recycled. 26 percent of plastic in Europe is recycled. With the exception of Japan, most other countries do not have long-term recycling programs available. China is by far the largest source of plastic mismanagement and pollution in the ocean. However, they cannot be entirely blamed as the United States and Europe send back unrecycled plastic, which China buys in the form of mixed bales of plastic scrap. These are recyclable materials contaminated with food and dirt or non-recyclable materials. In the ocean, plastic has been found virtually everywhere and in various forms. However, open ocean and coastal ocean, pla coastal ocean plastic pollution differ greatly. Deep water pollution, which refers to pollution 500 to 600 miles from the coastline, is an area yet to be fully explored. At least since the 1980s, ocean pollution has been thought to begin in our own backyards, in the sewage systems and riverways. Dr. Bracco's research is conducted using an instrument known as the manta trough, a, which is deplored from a research vessel out in the open ocean, and every 10 minutes, a collection container is brought to the surface and collected particles are analyzed. Dr. Bracco's group is hoping to make generalizations about ocean pollution using pollution levels at the surface. However, it is difficult to make measurements about how much pollution is in the ocean because this method only measures pollution at the surface, but leaves unknown what is beneath. Most plastic floats, yet it's not obvious that it floats in all stages of degradation. In the ocean, there are five regions known as gyres, which are the result of different warm and cold currents and are basically large swirling patches of water. The garbage tends to migrate towards these gyres, forming garbage patches. Using these patches, the pollution percentages have been analyzed over the past several years. More plastic is being produced, and recycling rates have not increased, yet pollution percentages have remained the same in these garbage patches. Even in countries where recycling rates have increased, pollution percentages have remained the same. An example of this is Norway, one of the top recyclers in the world, yet they still have tons of plastic in their waterways. There are four possible theories to explain where the plastic is going. One, shore deposition. Two, nanofragmentation. Three, biofouling. And four, ingestion by plankton and fish. Whoops, sorry. The first theory, shore deposition, states that the plastic simply gathers on beaches. But this is hard to conclude because it could have been left on the beach by patrons or it could be broken down and gathered in the sand, which already contains large amounts of plastic and is difficult to measure. Two, nanofragmentation. This theory states that organic material, or excuse me, this theory states that bacterial populations that feed on the plastic help digest and break it down. Three, biofouling. This theory states that organic matter forms or grows on the plastic, increasing its density, causing it to sink to the ocean floor where it is unable to be accounted for. And lastly, ingestion by plankton, fish, and other animals. The final topic that Dr. Bracco touched on was microbeads. Microbeads are small plastic pieces found in toothpaste and face washes. They are made of polyethylene or poly polypropylene. They are plastic abrasives and they are less harsh on the skin compared to natural products, and they are cheap to make. 
They can be used daily, and body functions will still remain the same. They enter the water supply through septic systems or sewage overflows, and once they enter the water system, there is nothing they can do to be removed. In Lake Ontario alone, they have been found in 250,000 particles per square kilometer. Up to six states have banned the products, banned products containing microbeads because of the damage and pollution they are causing. A few cities and counties are joining, including New York City. However, this legislation is diversive and may not be passed. These microbeads end up in our drinking water. However, they are so small, we can't tell. The use of them is most likely illegal because according to the Stockholm Agreement, persistent organic pollutants, POPs, amounts in water need to be below a certain level, which microbeads exceed. However, they're so small, it's hard to do research and tell how many microbeads there really are in water. I learned a great deal from this lecture. For one, the importance of making sustainable decisions in all areas of my life, and the impact a seemingly small decision, such as using a toothpaste containing microbeads, has on the ecosystem as a whole. I learned a little oceanography, and most importantly, I learned something needs to be done, and quickly, to stop this growing issue. Thank you.